Good evening. Um, I'm Isabel Armstrong. I'm chairing this Hilda Hume Lecture for 2021 this evening. The Hilda Hume Memorial Lectures were established in 1985 following a donation from her husband, Mr. Mohammed Aslam, in memory of her. Hilda was a reader in the English department of UCL, a place in which there were actually very few women. She was a fiercely independent Yorkshire woman, and she worked in Shakespeare studies, in language, and in the 19th century. And the topics of the Hilda Hume are um, uh, in those three areas. They've been given by very distinguished people, Barbara Hardy, Jerry McCann, Helen Vendler, Stanley Wells, Rosemary Ashton, and Hilary Fraser. Now to turn to our lecturer of this evening. I'm so delighted to welcome uh, a speaker who has been a colleague at Birkbeck and was such a delightful person uh, to, to live with uh, in that context. He is, Steve Connor is a dazzling and prolific critic always, always surprising us. He has written on individuals, on Beckett, James Joyce, Dickens. He's written on postmodernist culture and theories of the contemporary, but he specializes, it seems to me, as well as in these more orthodox categories of criticism in quite unusual and taxonomically totally surprising uh, forms of research. Dr Dumbstruck, for instance, a cultural history of ventriloquism, paraphernalia, magical things, the book of skin, a philosophy of sport, dream machines, technographies. Uh, this was quite recent, uh, where he explores imaginary machines, including ourselves. The book that I find most charming and extraordinary is the recent Beyond Words, with its curious subtitle of Hisses and Gurus, and its chapter headings, which are the categories of noises beyond articulate speech. So the chapter headings will run ahem, or tss or hiss, or mmm, or grr, and when we open these chapters, we find a quite extraordinary polymathic range of thinking and um, understanding, which is, which is truly amazing. Uh, in the mm chapter, for instance, Steve ranges from the up in Chad to a passage in, in, to India. He is a polymath, a ludic and searching polymath, a playful and profound one. Steve Connor. Thank you so much um, for that, Isabel. It's um, such such a pleasure and such an honour, um, an intense, but also really rather strenuous honour to have been asked to give the 2021 Hilda Hume Lecture. It's an honour that becomes the more arduous, the later one comes in the series of such distinguished lecturers stretching out like the succession of royal apparitions in Macbeth. For it means that one has to try to live up not just to Hilda Hume's own example, but that of one's own antecedents. So my aim tonight <coughs> is to talk about different kinds of work in Dickens's Great Expectations. In particular, the work of writing and writing, that is writing with and without a G. The opening of Hilda Hume's explorations in Shakespeare's language explains that her purpose is to bring together the common currency of Elizabethan speech and the heightened language of dramatic art. She makes it clear it was as a linguist that she first became concerned with the less literary English, as she puts it, of Shakespeare's time. But this involves a kind of co-creation between dramatist and audience. <coughs> Excuse me. And she focuses on Shakespeare's drama, B, 
because she says, there is more in the cut and thrust of dramatic dialogue than the more musically organized or secret language of the poems. <clears throat> You'll have to excuse me, it's an absolutely glorious day here. I'm speaking from Cambridge, but it's brought out my hay fever. In a sense, <coughs> she teaches us to apprehend the pressure on Shakespeare's work of an audience trained to strenuous listening and quick response, which Shakespeare could also assume to be, as she puts it, an audience in training. Hilde Hume was more than usually aware of Shakespeare's extraordinary receptiveness to forms of popular language, remarking that his memory and recomposition of classical proverbs entered living into the quick forge and working house of his thought. The illusion she swiftly strikes out here is to the prologue to act five of Henry V, <coughs> in which the chorus invites the audience themselves to forge in thought the scene of the King's triumphant return to London, having refused the invitation of his Lords to have borne his bruised helmet and his bended sword before him. When we are exhorted, now behold in the quick forge and working house of thought how London doth pour out her citizens. It's the playhouse that is the working house of thought, the thought of the citizens pouring out of their workplaces into the street theatre of pageant, and in the process, of course, <coughs> in the process forging themselves in thought. Dickens inherits from Shakespeare, I think, this sense of language as a kind of workshop. And in the process, works away at the question of what work is and does. <coughs> in Great Expectations, Dickens not only responds to the urgent gospel of work of which the Victorians made so much, he also anticipates the metaphysical conundrums that have come more and more to attach to the question of work in our day. It's been said to live one day of Dickens's life would be enough to kill most people. And may, many people assume that it was indeed the unrelenting will to work of Dickens's life that may have hastened his own death. Dickens is not the only 19th century writer or artist to preoccupy himself with work, but perhaps no writer uh, in, in no writer is there so marked and sustained a communication between the representation of work and the work of representing it, Dickens's own work. Dickens is concerned obsessively, which is to say he works at it without being able to stop working at it, meaning that in a sense it works at him, with the meaning of the means of production to fall into the lingo of a vanished time. It's quite easy to see Dickens as G.K. Chesterton does, as a sort of one-man embodiment of industrial capitalism, who, says Chesterton, set himself far too much to be a sort of universal provider, to keep a huge factory of fiction roaring night and day, to keep in touch with his public, like a big business with its customers. We must imagine Pip being born around 1803 and reaching maturity perhaps some 20 years before 1861 when Great Expectations was published. And the novel seems largely set in a world not only as Pip tells us before the age of daguerreotypes, but also before the age of the huge heavy industry that features in a novel like Hard Times. But it is marked by a concern with the nature of work that comes from what might be called the parallel industrialization of the soft work of government and administration and record keeping and finance with writers being poised ambiguously between these two realms of the anvil and the desk. Great Expectations is built around the mystery of the fact of the profound appalling discontinuity between the realms of physical and mental work, honest toil and fiction, forgery and fabulation, even as there is an unbreakable chain of links that connects them one to the other. The 19th century is the high point of the industrial revolution as we know it, 
marked a parallel rise in the work of bureaucracy that ghosted and mimicked those corporeal processes of plying, smelting, and shoveling. The effort to extract the maximum of work and to understand the thermodynamic laws that governed it would lead William Thompson, later Lord Kelvin, to a formulation of the laws of thermodynamics that would make the hard work of physical transformation, moving weight through distance in the classical definition, and the soft work of sorting, counting, and statistical arrangement, uncannily equivalent in what would come to be known in the 20th century as information theory. Animals, I think, cannot without sentimentality be said or thought to work. And for this reason, that work is the action of work informed by the idea of work, where the idea of work is no more than the idea that work can transform action into idea. There is, I'm afraid, no easy and once and for all denouement of this loop of recursion. This introduces into work the question which must always be in play when it's a matter of work, of whether the work in question is really work, honest toil, as we say, rather than dishonest simulation. We do not ask ourselves often enough, I think, why the test of work is not whether, whether or how well it works, but rather whether it is real, a matter, therefore, not of physics so much as metaphysics. In fact, we must recognize, and Dickens will have us recognize in Great Expectations, that trickery, pretense, and simulation are welded together with the idea of work right from the beginning. Honest toil can always slither away into glib and oily art. The principle of what has been called the gospel of work was articulated by Thomas Carlyle when he said, properly speaking, all true work is religion in 1843. Older than all preached gospels was this unpreached, inarticulate, but ineradicable, forever enduring gospel, work and therein have well-being. The gospel of work is usually understood to mean that working is a kind of displaced worship or corporeal prayer in action the orare of laborare. For Carlyle and others, it seems that work is the means to a life devoted to the principles of Christian morality. And even the work might come to play the role once played by religion. In the medieval world in which, as Carlyle wrote, our religion is not yet a horrible, restless doubt, still less a far horribler composed cant but a great heaven high unquestionability, encompassing, interpenetrating the whole of life. Actually though, I think this is a strange view of the medieval world, for we may see the industrialized prayer mills into which monasteries in Europe were transformed as an anticipation of just the kind of mechanization that the renewed religion of work in the 19th century was intended to combat. The idea of the gospel of work can be taken at once literally and in a stronger, stranger sense that Carlyle cannot have meant. The, the idea of work may be identical with something like a devotional, even perhaps a positively mystical principle. One devotes oneself to the devotional action that work is. So the physics of work become imbued with the metaphysics of work. Ever since Walter Houghton asserted in the Victorian frame of mind in 1957 that the essence of religion for Christians and for agnostics, the meaning of life, came more and more to lie in strenuous labor for the good of society, the gospel of work has been seen as a kind of stay against religious doubt. From our position, the inverse must seem increasingly to be the case. Namely, that religion is invoked as a reassuring substitute and foundation for the essential emptiness of the mythos of work. Honest toil is intended to boil away the mists of doubt and uncertainty, but instead repeatedly brews up a kind of ergological mysticism. 
So I want to make out the shape of a sort of argument that Dickens makes about work in Great Expectations. Um, it's a varying, uncertain, unconcluded argument. Um, and it is as so often, especially in Dickens, an argument forged not through propositions or consequences or exemplary instances, but the abuttings and adjacencies of, of physical objects, and especially in Great Expectations, objects that are subject to physical working. In many other writers, items from the material world are made to carry or bear out thematic concerns, often introduce, introduced in the form of emblems or motifs in the narration, the web in George Eliot's Middle Mar March, the motif of the cracked bowl in Henry James's The Golden Bowl. But in Dickens's work, the vagrant argument of things is much less governed by novelistic theme or meaning, seeming to emerge through chains of delinquent insistence and sometimes insidious intent, like something almost being said that goes beyond thematic government. The pen that should order and subdue the world of mute things is subject to the transformations wrought by those things, becoming at one point in the novel, one of them in the pen with which a celebrated forgery had been committed, which is kept on display among Samuel Wemmick's collection of criminal curios. As Joe Gargery moralistically affirms, life is made of ever so many partings welded together. Getting a living, more than any other writer of the 19th century, I think Dickens is concerned with the process of what had come to be known as getting a living. The phrase occurs right at the beginning of the novel, at a point where there can be no reasonable expectation that the young Pip can have any thoughts of getting any such thing. As Pip tells us that, to five little stone lozenges, each about a foot and a half long, which were arranged in a neat row beside their grave and were sacred to the memory of five little brothers of mine who gave up trying to get a living exceedingly early in that universal struggle, I am indebted for a belief I religiously entertained that they'd all been born on their backs with their hands in their trousers pockets and had never taken them out in this state of existence. The universal struggle seems to make for the interchangeability of simply living with getting a living. Death, by contrast, is identified here not as is conventional with restful sleep, but as a kind of idle malingering, waiting perhaps for something to turn up with that extraordinary conceit of having been born and buried with your hands in your trousers pockets. Later in the novel, Dickens will share a rather similar joke about the crossed legs of the memorial representations of crusaders as a reminder of this chaste comportment. On the one hand, being born with your hands in your pockets implies being disinclined to be born at all, since the posture seems to dispose you in advance to the horizontal inclination of the grave. On the other hand, so to speak, the idea of being buried in this posture implies a kind of shifty detachment, even from one's own post-mortem condition, making this state of existence no existence or settled state at all. When the verbal noun living recurs, as it frequently does in Great Expectations, it's often in association with the idea of pockets. Dickens allows himself, or at least the character he named, Herbert Pocket, a feebly evasive joke on the word living when Herbert is telling Pip of his fiancée's invalid father. Her father had to do with a vittling of passenger ships. I think he was a species of purser. What is he now? said I. He's an invalid now, replied Herbert. Living on? On the first floor, said Herbert, which was not at all what I meant for I, I had intended my question to apply to his means. We hear not very much more of this man, or rather we hear much more of him than we come to know about him, in the fact that he makes tremendous rows, roars and pegs at the floor with some frightful instrument. The mad, menacingly empty sonority of this histrionic strutting and fretting conveys the narrative immediately to another embodiment of vacuous business, 
and oddly enough, via the filling of an awkwardly vacant moment in the text with the searching of a pocket. As we contemplated the fire, we read, and as I thought, what a difficult vision to realize this same capital sometimes was, I put my hands in my pockets. A folded piece of paper in one of them attracting my attention, I opened it and found it to be the playbill I had received from Joe relative to the celebrated provincial amateur of Roskian renown. And bless my heart, I involuntarily added aloud, it's tonight. Living on the first floor, and on no manner of business but stage business, does indeed seem apt for Mr. Wopsle, whose chaotic performance of Hamlet, Pip and Herbert will straightway take themselves off to see. Indeed, the roaring but spectral Bill Barley, living on the first floor, is paralleled by Mr. Wopsle's theatrical endeavours during the dinner at the Blue Boar that follows Pip's indenturing. We are told, rather late in the evening, Mr. Wopsle gave us Collins's ode and threw his bloodstained sword in thunder down with such effect that a waiter came in and said, the commercials underneath sent up their compliments and it wasn't the tumbler's arms. This chain of associations involving uh, floors and making a living and hammering with sticks seems to include Miss, Hamish, Miss Havisham, uh, who deploys her crutch stick as she limps up and down her room in Satis house in a kind of pantomimic parody of the hammer blows struck in the forge and on the stage by Mr. Wopsle. Hammer and crutch are brought together in the enigmatic rune that the brain damaged Mrs. Gargery inscribes on her slate after she has been attacked. Again, and again, and again, my sister had traced upon the slate a character that looked like a curious T, and then with the utmost eagerness had called our attention to it as something she particularly wanted. I had in vain tried everything producible that began with the T, from tar to toast and tub. At length, it had come into my head that the sign looked like a hammer. And on my lustily calling that word in my sister's ear, she had begun to hammer on the table and had expressed a qualified assent. Thereupon, I brought in all our hammers, one after another, but without avail. Then I bethought me of a crutch, the shape being much the same, and I borrowed one in the village and displayed it to my sister with considerable confidence. This pseudo-ergodic chain of sticks and hammers extends to the location of Pip's education at the hands of his tutor, Matthew Pocket, as well as of the disorganized tumbling and general perplexity in the house in, where else could it be, Hammersmith. The word living returns in the first interchange Pip has with Magwitch on his return to London, as Pip asks, how are you living? And then it recurs again in Magwitch's way of beginning his narrative of his life. I first became aware of myself down in Essex, a thieving turnips for my living. The simple words which Pip speaks in the closing interchange with Estella in the novel establish the condition which he has laboriously achieved by that point. I work pretty hard for a sufficient living and yes, I do well. Although uh, the novel is marked by Joe Gargery's strong sense of the virtue of industry as it's described, Great Expectations resembles other Dickens novels too in the abundance of its evocations of lethargic indolence, the counterpart to The Forge being Miss Havisham's Satis House, or rather the disused brewery that is the permanent reminder of the ruined business of her life and inheritance. Dickens takes care to have Herbert Pocket tell us that Miss Havisham's father was a country gentleman down in your part of the world, it was a brewer. I don't know why it should be a crack thing to be a brewer, but it's indisputable that while you cannot possibly be genteel and bake, you may be as, be as genteel as never was and brew. You see it every day. The gentility of brewing for Dickens seems to have much to do with its condition of haunted, languid, 
ruin, not quite lifeless, but the sour simulacrum of life on which the text insists. There were no pigeons in the dovecot, no horses in the stable, no pigs in the sty, no malt in the storehouse, no smells of grains and beer in the copper or the vat. All the uses and scents of the brewery might have evaporated with its last reek of smoke. The link established in Pip's opening fancy between making a living and the institution of the pocket produces variations throughout the novel. Um, it seems, by the way, that Dickens, who made lists of names for possible use in his fiction, may have encountered the name Pocket in 1858, when he stayed at the George Hotel in Nailsworth, where the landlord was a Mr. Pocket, spelt with two Ts. Pockets are implicated, for example, in the tableau vivant, Dickens, scarcely vivant, in fact, Dickens provides of the languorous business untransacted in the village street. Mr. Pumblechook appeared to conduct his business by looking across the street at the saddler, who appeared to transact his business by keeping his eye on the coachmaker, who appeared to get on in life by putting his hands in his pockets and contemplating the baker, who in his turn folded his arms and stared at the grocer, who stood at his door and yawned at the chemist. The novel gives us also, of course, Miss Havisham's parasitic relative, Sarah Pocket, and her husband, Matthew, already mentioned, and the funereal reminiscence of the first description of the slouching, work-shy Orlick, who, on working days, would come slouching from his hermitage with his hands in his pockets and his dinner loosely tied in a bundle round his neck. Bentley Drummle is also characterised by the hands in Pocket's posture, and Pockets are also implicated in the business of financial speculation or the pseudo-industrious indolence enacted by Herbert Pocket himself. I think I shall trade also, said he, putting his thumbs in his waistcoat pockets, to the West Indies for sugar, tobacco and rum, also to Ceylon, especially for elephant's tusks. You will want a good many ships, said I. Perfect fleet, said he. Quite overpowered by the magnificence of these transactions, I asked him where the ships he insured mostly traded to at present. I haven't begun insuring yet, he replied. I'm looking about me. Uh, on that... <laughs> On that very word, my contact lens has moved to <laughs> an unhelpful corner of my eye. So please excuse me as I um, store it to the position it needs to be. <laughs> Pockets and property are ludicrously adverted to again in the vague figure of Mrs. Pocket, described as highly ornamental, but perfectly helpless and useless, who, when all of her six little pockets are in various stages of tumbling up, seems unable to keep track even of her own pocket handkerchief, which she keeps dropping and having to have handed her to her by the maid Flopson. And finally, the drowned compison ends up being so horribly disfigured that he was only recognizable by the contents of his pockets. There is a kind of inaugurating source for this chain of pockets in Great Expectations. In a joke that is as absurdly physical as it's metaphysical, if a pocket is a positive space of absence about your person, Pip has to cope with the absence even of the positive space of the pocket. It is this absence of a pocket at least one large enough to conceal a crust of bread and a file, which requires Pip to secrete them down his own trouser leg, thereby, in a sense, making a pocket of his own person. Dickens cannot have believed his luck when he realised he could contrive a scene in which, hastily hiding the crust of bread, while Joe momentarily looks away at the table, Pip can be accused of having bolted his food, meaning swallowed it down hastily without chewing. 
The primary meaning of the simple but vastly adaptable English word bolt seems to be that of a projectile, as in a crossbow bolt, which is then transferred to any sudden impulsive or convulsive movement, as in a lightning bolt or one who sits bolt upright. But the word had come by the 14th century to be applied to the shackle or fetter applied to the leg of a captive, as it is in Magwitch's case. Pip's sense of guilt will come to be focused in the sense of a load on his leg as though he were literally fettered by his dishonesty. The two opposed meanings of bolting, of sudden spasmodic movement and the constraint that prevents it, are drawn enigmatically together in the proverb about shutting the stable door after the horse is bolted, which is so often subject to awkward error in which the speaker trips themselves up in speaking of bolting the door after the horse has bolted. And in fact, horses, now I come to mention them, are also caught up in the play of appearance and apparition in Great Expectations. Shoeing horses is, of course, a principal part of Joe Gargery's trade, but horses prove to be strangely phantasmal or caught up in the process of fabulation or forging throughout the novel. Partly in desperation, partly in mischievous revenge during his interrogation by his sister and Pompletuk, Pip conjures up a gothicized Cinderella scene involving Miss Havisham sitting in a black velvet coach. Where was this coach in the name of Gracious? asked my sister. In Miss Havisham's room. They stared again. But there weren't any horses to it. I added this saving clause in the moment of rejecting four richly caparisoned courses, which I had had wild thoughts of harnessing. Pip then will later tell us that in the night before his departure for London, there were coaches in my broken sleep going to wrong places instead of to London and having in the traces now dogs, now cats, now pigs, now men, never horses. The blending of the actual and the spectral in the idea of the horse returns in Magwitch's account of his great expectations for Pip. I mustn't see my gentleman a footing it in the mire of the streets. There mustn't be no mud on his boots. My gentleman must have horses, Pip. Horses to ride and horses to drive and horses for his servant to ride and drive as well. Shall colonists have their horses and blood uns, if you please, good Lord. And not my London gentleman. No, no. We'll show them another pair of shoes than that pit, won't us? As well as being bound up with alternating conceptions of horse power, there is a an inherence of opposites in the name of the building that adjoins the, ha the house that Pip occupies and the occupation that constitutes the expectation in which it has been raised, the forge. The work of forging is associated early in the novel with the work of making links or ligatures when Joe is set to work by the soldiers to repair a defective set of handcuffs that are intended to constrain the escaped convict once caught. Forging is, of course, the process of making things, but is more particularly the process of making them up in the sense of pretending to make them or joining them together. These two meanings of the word forge existed uh, in a, a kind of steady parallel until the beginning of the 17th century, after which forgery more and more came to mean what it always, in fact, seems to in Shakespeare's usage uh, in the tautologous false forgeries to which he refers at the beginning of The Passionate Pilgrim. Indeed, since about the mini middle or so of the, seven, of the 16th century, the word forge, meaning to make, frame or construct, has narrowed its semantic range, retaining its primary meaning only really in application to the specific kind of labor represented by the blacksmith's occupation. Thomas Hayward's reference in 1624 to a statue of Ceres holding in its right hand what is described as the image of victory most curiously forged still implies honest design rather than deceit. But this is a late appearance of this usage and it would not long continue after this date. 
Not only is the devil associated with idleness, proverbially making work for idle hands, one might reasonably surmise, I think, that the long career of the devil consists essentially in being nothing but the personification of the imposture of work. Medieval doctrine indeed avoided the troubling limitation on the powers of God that's implied by the antagonism of the devil by insisting that the devil could only inform him, uh, I'm sorry, the, the devil could only perform his work by permission of God, meaning that his power was not real, but simulated. Uh, the only power that he had was the power of simulation itself. The observant and neat-fingered being who tormented James Clark Maxwell with the possibility that it might be possible to perform physical work without the expenditure of any physical energy, simply by sliding a shutter to set fast-moving molecules apart from slower-moving molecules in a volume of gas, this being is aptly known nowadays as Maxwell's demon, the name which was actually given to Maxwell's conception by William Thompson. Maxwell's notion is a thought experiment of a particularly knotted kind, since it in a sense asks if thought could indeed act in experience. In fact, the figure of the blacksmith in folklore is characterized by a curious intimacy between virtue and vice honesty and imposture, with the devil a frequent visitor in disguise to the blacksmith's forge. The fact that the devil is so frequently outwitted by the figure of the blacksmith, for example, in the story of St. Dunstan, nipping the nose of the devil with a pair of pliers, suggests that the power of guile is somehow conceived as part of the operations of the forge. The smoky imagery of hell, which for the Mediterranean Dante was, of course, a place of excruciating frigor, has much of the blacksmith's forge about it. Dickens allows these diabolical associations in to Joe, Joe Gardery's forge in the person of Orlick, who teases Pip, as we're told, that the devil lived in a black corner of the forge and that he knew the fiend very well. Also that it was necessary to make up the fire once in seven years with a live boy and that I might consider myself fuel. Following the recapture of Magwitch, it's assumed that the convict has come down the chimney to steal a pie and Joe's file, though it's, in fact it's of course been uh, his temporary Confederate Pip. The devil, is involved with Pip's desperate, defiant inventions about what has happened in Miss Havisham's house, which are solemn, comically reproved by Joe. There's one thing you must be sure of, Pip, said Joe after some rumination, namely that lies is lies. Howsoever they come, they didn't ought to come. And they come from the father of lies and work round to the same. And Dickens takes care to remind us of the many deceitful actions of forgery throughout Great Expectations. The young Pip is told, people are put in the hulks because they murder and because they rob and forge and do all sorts of bad. As a young man in London, uh, we hear of uh, Jaggers Clark Wemmick um, describing the career, career of one, one of the criminals of whom he keeps a bust. He forged wills, this blade did if he didn't also put the supposed testators to sleep too. And Magwitch describes the speciality of his criminal partner, Compison, in similar terms as swindling, handwriting, forging, stolen banknote passing and such like. He'd no more heart than an iron file. He was as cold as death and he had the head of the devil aforementioned. So Dickens makes the link between authentic and deceitful manufacture difficult to um, avoid noticing. And in fact, Dickens brings these two realms together that I earlier on characterized as the domains of the anvil and uh, the writing desk in a knockabout but poignant comic scene of Joe the blacksmith engaged in the labor of writing. In fact, going and sitting down at the very desk at which we can imagine uh, Pip himself indicting this story. It's a scene that seems almost to be a dramatization of the identity of the words handwriting and 
manufacture. At my own writing table, pushed into a corner and cumbered with little bottles, Joe now sat down to his great work, first choosing a pen from the pen tray, as if it were a chest of large tools, and tucking up his sleeves as if he were going to wield a crowbar or a sledgehammer. It was necessary for Joe to hold on heavily to the table, with his left elbow and to get his right leg well out behind him before he could begin. And when he did begin, he made every downstroke so slowly that it might have been six feet long, while at every upstroke I could hear his pen spluttering extensively. He had a curious idea that the inkstand was on the side of him where it was not and constantly dipped his pen into space and seemed quite satisfied with the result. This open metonymic chain of hands, pockets, bread, bolts, cuffs, files, sticks, hammers, pens, papers, ink, handkerchief, all seems to snap together in the return of Magwitch when Pip instantly recognises him. No need to take a file from his pocket and show it to me. No need to take the handkerchief from his neck and twist it round his head. So the struggle from which Dickens in this novel makes his own living is that between fiction and manufacture. Though work is a recurrent theme throughout Dickens's writing, in no other novel, I think, is the process whereby Dickens is making his own living acted out in such close parallel to the events of the novel. And in fact, in mid-April 1861, when he was embarking on the final stage of the novel, Dickens wrote to John Forster of what he called the general turn and tone of the working out and winding up, concluding, all the iron is in the fire and I have only to beat it out. Working has associations throughout Great Expectations also of mechanical operations proceeding as it were automatically. Probably the most brilliant of these suggestions is the sound that Magwitch makes in his throat. Something clicked in his throat as if he had works in him like a clock and was going to strike. The striking is suggestive indeed of a kind of clockwork in a sense that will be transferred to the workings of the book itself that we hold in our, as it were, hands. Dickens encourages us at various points to see the working out of his plot as a similar process, at once contrived and mechanical, working itself out, as it were, on its own. This is maybe most emphatically the case in the comparison that Pip draws between the shattering of his hopes and the elaborately murderous stratagem of a sultan in the story that he remembered from James Ridley's Tales of the Genie of 1764. Pip tells us all the work near and afar that tended to the end had been accomplished and in an instant the blow was struck and the roof of my stronghold dropped upon me. As Stanley Friedman has observed, where Ridley's narrative involves a fiendish device to murder two enchanters who have conspired against the vizier horror, Dickens makes the contrivance an elaborate deception practiced by Pip on himself in being permitted or compelled to participate in the working out of Pip's self-understanding, the reader, any reader, is also compelled to flick or click through the gearings of Dickens's plot. And a final link in the chain of these substitutions is provided by a little joke about his own upbringing that Dickens includes when Joe Gargery arrives in London to visit Pip and is asked whether he's had time to see anything of the city. Why, yes, sir, said Joe. Me and Watson went off straight to look at the Blackheen warehouse, but we didn't find it come up to its likeness in the red bills at the shop doors, which I mean to say, added Joe in an explanatory manner, as it is there drawn to architectural. In fact, this is not the mythical Blackheen factory owned by Jonathan Warren, which represented for the young Dickens the death of all his hopes, as he thought, 
of making a fine and eminent living for himself. That establishment was the rat infested building at Humberford Stairs, while Joe has been made to visit the rather grander establishment owned by Robert Warren in the Strand, with whom Dickens's employer had what John Forster described as a rivalry carried to wonderful extremes in the way of advertisement. Dickens, in fact, records uh, in his specimen of uh, his fragment of autobiography, having to cross to the other side of the Strand when he passed the latter establishment to avoid inhaling the pungent smell of the glue applied to the corks. Once again, the writer's craft is here associated with a certain self-disguising as well as a self-betraying guile. A blacking warehouse might aptly be regarded as a parodic, parurgic designation of the writer's trade mechanized, equivalent perhaps to Chesterton's huge factory of fictions. Readers would not be equipped to appreciate Dickens's joke until the appearance of the short um, a fragment of uh, autobiography uh, in the first volume of John Forster's biography in 1872, which in fact concludes with the words, I know how all these things have worked together to make me what I am. Work is a serious affair, of course. And perhaps in some illuminating sense, work is seriousness itself. Walter Houghton's discussion of the Victorian gospel of work is part of his chapter on earnestness, which is nowadays not the sort of topic that people are intellectually disposed or equipped to count as a serious topic. But it seems likely that both religion and work themselves are best or at least most absorbingly understood as earnests, pledges or placeholders of the importance of being earnest. Work is important, of course, because it appears to get things done in the way that's necessary to sustain very large numbers of human beings in the ways they take it for granted that it is important they are sustained. As one would expect, academic work on the question of work in universities is concentrated in broad daylight sober-side subjects like physics, politics, economics, social history, and latterly the data studies that seem destined greyly to pervade the entire field of academic inquiry. But the topic of work is more properly, I think, the province of subjects equipped to pay attention to faith operations and dream theatres, and the importance accorded to forms of importance, which is to say subjects like literature and philosophy and what other kinds of inquiry might make it their business to make sense of the workings of collective psychopathology or that phantasmal fusion of the thermodynamic and the thaumaturgic we might name thermodynamics. Ah, uh, Steve, thank you for a, a virtuosic discussion. Um, I'm, I'm full of it. The idea of the pocket as, as it were, um, the carrying around of emptiness. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely notion. Um, it's, this, this talk has been full of, of really thrilling possibilities um, and uh, it's it's delivered with this eloquence and and um, uh, drama that uh, I'm used to hearing from you. Um, now um, we can take a Q and A. Um, I'm just wondering, would you like to field the questions, or would you like me to convey them to you, or what? Um, I I think you would probably convey them from the Q and A where. Uh, at the moment, it is a little um, empty pocket. Oh. Uh, uh, but I'm, I'm happy to um, to have any questions or comments that anyone. Uh, has. Yeah, there's no, there are no open questions yet. But um, I think people might still be thinking through the virtuosity of your talk and uh, and wondering about it. Um, while that's happening. Uh, 
I want to ask you about uh, another thing that uh, has occurred to me as I read the novel this time. Um, I, I was uh, triumphantly aware of pockets in my last reading and so uh, slightly sad that you had superseded me. Um, but one of the things that uh, seemed to be go obsessively through the novel are the decoration of the extremities, shoes in particular, mm -hmm. shoes everywhere from the shoes, uh, the shoe of, of, of Miss Havisham's shoe um, round her, her deserted dressing table to the, to the man uh, whom they meet on, on, on their journey up the Thames in an attempt to get Magwitch out of the way, um, who has boastfully talked about wearing a drowned man's shoe. And um, I, I just wonder, boots, the boots of the, bo of the serving boy who uh, Pip hires and doesn't know what to do with, um, does the shoe in any way seem to you to match up or, or correlate with any of these metonymic images that you've mentioned? Um, yes. The hammer, uh, the pocket. Um, I, I just wonder if, there, if, if it's a different series or whether it's perhaps something that um, relates to the, this wonderful uh, conjury of, yes. of uh, words. I, 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, Pip, Pip is, is um, uh, painfully aware not only of the, this sort of spectral weight that he's carrying on his leg, but also of his heavy shoes. You know, that's the sign of being a common laboring boy that you've got heavy shoes and they obviously sort of blur into the horseshoes that are, that are Joe Gargery's stock in trade. You know, that they, they, they just, they, they somehow belong to a phenomenal world of, of pure weight, pure heaviness rather than, rather than form. Um, and yes, I had actually. I think I think one could very well make out a whole little kind of genealogy um, of shoes. And what I didn't mention there it is is cuffs as well. There's oh. quite a lot of business with um, that other kind of extremi extremity, um, which are cuffs, which are um, meant, I'm sure, to remind us of the handcuffs. That, are, that, are, that feature early on in the novel. I, more and more, whenever I read Dickens, um, uh, I, I get the feeling um, that I know at least a little part of what it was like to be Dickens writing these things, which I think was absolutely not a process of trying to work through um, ideas, things or arguments, but a process rather of improvising, sort of juggling with imaginary objects and with making them <coughs> speak to and work with each other um, in, in these um, open, open, interlinking kind of series. Um, there is probably some sort of play that I've not noticed with hats, since hats yeah. are the opposite of shoes and signify, you know, for Beckett, for example, the hat is the cerebral part of being rather than the corporeal um, part of being. Uh, for Carlyle in Past and Present that I quoted in 1843, a great sort of source of Victorian thought about the nature of work, um, Carlyle has, has great fun with the advertising um, stunt of the man who, instead of devoting himself to making hats of fine manufacture, devotes himself um, to the seven foot hat, which is presumably a hat that is being cycled around London as a kind of advertising display, which belongs to the world of sham um, rather than, than actual labor. I can see a couple of questions that are going. I see that there are a couple of questions. Let me see, I'm not quite sure what I have to do with them. I think I have to, um, um, one, there's one from Claire Lees, yeah. Um, uh, who says, thank you so much for that brilliant lecture. You have made a powerful case for the work of criticism. Could you say a bit more about a related issue, the work uh, or is it pleasure of reading Dickens in particular? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's one of the things, all disciplines are characterized by the things that they don't notice about what they do, that they set aside, that everybody else knows. So everybody else outside the, the guild of literary study knows why people read and write books. 
for fun. Uh, we do know this uh, and we get a lot of fun ourselves. It's just, I think we feel a little bit kind of squeamish about it. So we do turn it into a very earnest kind of affair, um, the matter of reading. But um, the reason why I continue to do this kind of thing 40, year, 40 years after having taken it up is because it's the best fun that it is possible to have. And the best fun because it is the most laborious kind of fun. There's a moment in Great Expectations when um, Pip is being sent to play in a rather grotesque way at, at Miss Havisham's. And uh, he wonders how he's gonna do this. And his sister says, he'll play or I'll work him. <coughs> so, you know, playing and working very <coughs> close um, in this respect. And, uh, and in a certain sense, you know, this is the thing that children know about playing, that play is no fun at all, unless it's, you know, something that is um, something in which you are uh, absorbed as deeply as any action of working. Um, and, and then Catherine Waters has wondered about um, women's work and there is uh, no doubt at all that included in the kind of conspectus of different kinds of working uh, in which the question of whether it is work or not or honest work or not are the various kinds of um, female work female service, which of course are so important a feature of the 19th century and which in, in a certain kind of sense we have inherited at least since the Second World War um, with the enormous growth of, of what is called um, uh, the service industry characterized by the thing that people call emotional labor. Um, so it does seem to me that, that Dickens in this respect and in others is asking the question that we that we are more puzzled by than ever as to what is work and what is its importance. You know, if if our attention can be um, harnessed by Amazon, if our sheer you know, if watching cat videos um, is a way of working unconsciously for Amazon, what is work after all? Um, mm -hmm. And of course, women's work has been caught up in this kind of, well, you, it, it, can't, it can't be work because it's a special kind of devotion. Um, and, if you, and if you were to be paid for it, that would somehow kind of cheapen it. You know. I think we have uh, time for just one more yes. uh, question. And um, that's from Miriam. Wonderful talk. And thank you for the marvellous reading out of passages. Dickens' humour really showed in the small interchange about not yet insuring ships. I wonder if you can comment on how Dickens viewed his own work or the working world in general with an eye out for the comic. Yes, I mean, I do, I do think that um, there is something, uh, there is something exploitative about the business of comedy and having an, an eye out uh, for the comic that Dickens was comically attuned to that in a certain kind of way, making people laugh at the world is a sort of putting of the world to work in appearance and representation in the way in which um, Dickens so kind of insistently does in a way that other kinds of writing don't, don't seem to be. I do think that there, there is a link there. Um, and I think that one of the most important things about Dickens and one of the things that Dickens helps us understand other writers do as well, I think actually Shakespeare does as well, um, is that he, he makes us understand that work is really not the opposite of all the things that it's held to be the opposite of, you know, that, I mean, the fact that, that comedy is held to be more mechanical than tragedy um, is very much part of that, that there is a particular kind of impassioned mechanism that's involved in, in comic, writing um, that means, you know, it means it, it, it absolutely has to work, as we say, uh, or it doesn't work at all. Um, so, so I do think that um, that's a very interesting insight um, into, into Dickens' understanding. And with that, we will have to close this session. I'd like to thank you for a magnificent and uh, again, virtuosic talk and um, I'm sure that everybody has found these insights 
um, leading to further insights. That's the wonderful thing about the kind of talk you give. So thank you very much. And um, thank you, the audience, for offering such lovely questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Good night.